Let's pray. O Lord, to sing of your grace, to forget ourselves and be lost in your love, to contemplate undeserved favor and infinite proportion and all that it means for us. Grace to enter into life with you. Grace enough to walk the Christian life and grace upon grace as we enter into your presence. Lord, thank you for these reminders. We are in need all over again of your grace. We thank you for the opportunity to be here together this morning on this occasion to think about what this means for our church, what it means for our friends who go to see the church birthed and grown. Lord, we long for the gospel to go beyond our walls and yet it is painful uh, when our friends go and take the gospel beyond our walls and painful in a good way. We rejoice in what you are doing. Give us aid for these things. Help us to benefit from your word by the power of your spirit here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy. And the title for this morning's message comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Last week, Omri preached for us four words from 1 Timothy, and he smuggled the entire book of 1 Timothy into those four words, grace be with y'all. This morning, we as a church will return the favor. Four words in the original, be strong in the grace, and we're going to smuggle the entire book of 2 Timothy into these four words this morning. This is a momentous occasion for us as a church. As you know, tomorrow morning, the Robinsons, Judy, the Miles, the Dudleys will get in their cars and drive across the country. They'll drive to New Orleans, New Orleans East, where the gospel is needed and the church is needed. This will be challenging for them. This will be challenging for us. In addition to Omri and Emily and Judy and Derek and Pam and Nick and Brittany, we send an army of the most interestingly named people (laughs) that have ever made one entourage. (laughs) Chloe, Obadiah, Jonah, Ezekiel, If you know the table of contents in your Bible or some of the characters, we're okay so far. Nashan, Kes Yun Shalom, Lee Yun Amani, Jehu. By the way, um, when Jehu gets his driver's license, watch out. (laughs) Saw a license plate the other day that had the verse reference that tagged driving like Jehu. He drives like a madman. Anyway. (laughs) Jehu Yun Malua Keukua, or something like that. Imara Yun Kamiya, Manoa Yun Santi, Zakai Everett, Milo Gimli, Galadriel Grace, and Coming Soon. Do we have a name yet? Do we get to vote on that one? <laughs> we do. Okay, ballots are open. And they are going to establish... Grace Bible Church, New Orleans. That's a significant name. Each one of the names in this entourage have significance to those families. They were named intentionally with purpose. Grace Bible Church, New Orleans has a name with purpose. Let's unpack that name for just a few moments. And Omri, you better mean it. Every syllable of this name, Grace. It's a good name for a church. Highlighting the gospel of God's grace only found in Jesus Christ. Bible. The task will be to unfold the whole counsel of God's word, as Paul refers in Acts 20, to hold nothing back that is profitable. Every verse, every word, all of it. And church. It's not a throwaway word. It's God's plan. It's God's institution for the expansion of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to Tempe to New Orleans to the ends of the earth. Church is Christ's bride. The church has a blueprint in Scripture. This is not a time to improvise. 
but to follow the script. And Grace Bible Church, NOLA, New Orleans. It's a place. New Orleans East is a place in need of grace, in need of the Word of God, in need of the church. Is this a fool's errand? With so many uncertainties, discomforts, even dangers. Perhaps in the world's eyes, of course in the world's eyes, the gospel is a fool's message. And undecorated proclamation of the gospel is a fool's method. But straightforward gospel heralding is actually God's wisdom and God's power. When all is done, the humble, faithful slaves of Christ will be vindicated and any naysayers will be ashamed. Gospel proclamation and church expansion, this is God's wise plan to redeem a people for his own glory. This is a good work. In Acts 18.10, we parachute into a scene with the Apostle Paul where he had been beaten and intimidated and he was timid. Maybe more famous are Paul's words to Timothy, timid Timothy, Paul has to tell Timothy, take courage. But here in Acts 18, Paul was scared. And Jesus came to Paul personally regarding the city at Corinth After being beat up from place to place to place, he was ready to leave Corinth. And Jesus personally said to him, do not fear, I have many people in this city. And so Paul remained and he taught them the word of God. And what was God pleased to produce from a sea of hostility? A church of saints, believers, trophies of grace. Paul stayed and taught them the word. Turn to Acts chapter 11. In Acts 11, 19 to 30, we find the church at Antioch. There were many who had been scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen. Remember, Stephen was stoned. And they made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But then there were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed and turned to the Lord. This is fresh territory, new territory, the gospel going to Jews and to Gentiles. Down in verse 30, we discover that the church at Antioch became aware of a need of believers back in Judea. And notice what verse 30 says. They sent the relief, the contribution for the churches there, in charge of Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas was the son of encouragement, and Saul, later Paul, was this Old Testament scholar, a radical persecutor of the church with an incredible testimony of having been floored by Jesus and now going to be an apostle to the Gentile world. In other words, the church at Antioch, out in its outpost for the gospel, sent two of its best to take care of needs of churches in other places. There's something for us to understand there. They didn't send the dregs. They didn't send the leftovers. They sent the best. In Acts 14, you can flip over there. Paul and his companions are in a city called Lystra where they healed a man and they preached good news. Good news, not not bad news. But good news, that there is life in Jesus Christ for all who would repent and turn to him. Eternal life, forgiveness of sins. That there actually is a savior of mankind who came and laid down his life to pay for our crimes and make us right before a holy God. This is the good news they preached. They they preached the, the glorious reality of the resurrection and forgiveness of sin. Enemies came and turned a fickle crowd against them. Look at verse 20. 
or verse 19, Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. While the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city, and the next day went with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had pointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul goes to a hard place, preaches good news. The politics change, the fickle crowd turns, and they throw rocks at Paul until they believe he is dead and leave his body outside the city. He comes to consciousness and walks back into the city. <laughs> Preaches the gospel in the next city and the next and the next and then goes back to the city where they stoned him and strengthened those who had believed. I don't want to talk you out of going to New Orleans and planting churches. <laughs> but this is a hard work. We know not what awaits you. Just as we don't know what awaits the Cans and the Twombly's in Papua New Guinea or the Molokas in Italy or Gilbert Bible Church. Many of you are here this morning. Thank you for leaving <laughs> and being faithful with the gospel in Gilbert. We miss you. When you leave here, Team Nola, you're out of sight but not out of heart. Our heart will yearn for you and we will feel the loss. And we think about the impact that you have had. I'll, I'll just start with Omri. And, and these things are out of order. But I am particularly thankful, Omri, for your pool cleaning discipleship. <laughs> and particularly in the life of one young man. And Cameron won't remain nameless. Thank you. The impact that you have had in his life, I get to benefit from as a young man discipled by Omri encourages me. I think about student ministries in an army of young men and women trained in the gospel, benefiting from your preaching, your shepherding, and your cultivation of spiritual disciplines. I think about the collegians and singles who benefited from your ministry and your discipleship. All of us have benefited from your time here in this pulpit, preaching, teaching in various venues, many avenues in the church. We benefit from the biblical counseling training, those who have sat under it, those who have benefited from it in the periphery. First Fridays, Mill Avenue, the, the street preaching, the cold turkey evangelism, uh, many in this room have gone with you and have learned from you, have watched as you preached the gospel and then you made them practice. The refining and the training and evangelism will bear fruit for years to come. I think about the book table and the bibliophiles you have generated. I grieve, Omri, that the ancient copy of a precious book that I ordered did not show up from London and I'm in a little bit of a fight with the bookseller. <laughs> I had hoped to hand it to you today. I think about the house of single guys. Omri, when you were single and living with the fellows, your spiritual leadership and your leadership development, your cultivation of biblical disciplines that would bear fruit in your marriage and parenting, they were done there. And you've been an example to many who have cared for roommates since. I think about the music. Uh, watched recently again the Modern Day Moses video, if you remember that one. The idea of someone training for ministry but taking out the trash in the meantime. It was Moses who spent a lot of time not leading the people out of Israel while God had him in school. 
And Omri lived that role here, silently serving this church in ways nobody will know but heaven, and being an example to many in that. I think about the music, Omri, and the invisibility. A stage is a terrible thing for a man. Notoriety, a microphone, a platform, a book deal, a social media following, fame. All of those temptations are real in whatever big or small circles we find ourselves and you have borne those temptations well. Chasing after hard things and training and invisible service rather than grabbing easy notoriety. And we still like your music. I think about sagebrush. Just about every time I show up there, you got a group of guys that you're discipling, leading, teaching, counseling. I think about your home and the benefits of the cultivation of spiritual disciplines there, your ministry to Emily and the kiddos, those arrows symbolized on your arm are gospel weapons fashioned to go out from your home. It's really remarkable symbolism Your approach to parenting is not, how do I uh, get these, these little people in my home to be pleasing to me, to be wonderful knickknacks on my shelf, but to cultivate people that you will one day pull back and launch. Uh, that's a selflessness in parenting. It's not about me. It's about actually being a servant to my kids as I wield authority in their lives so that they're equipped for a life of faithfulness to God. We pray for those little arrows that they may be regenerate and then be useful. Omri, you've been a colleague, a pastor, an encourager and a friend to me. You also know what it is to suffer to trust the Lord, and to keep going. You'll need that in New Orleans. When we consider the rest of the team, everything I just said about Omri just multiplies. Can't look at you. These wives, Emily, Pam, Brittany, young moms, Wonderful wives, wonderful examples. To the young ladies in this church, you're already doing Titus 2. I feel that impact in my home. Thank you. Derek, I'm a little offended the entire future football team of Chandler Preparatory Academy goes with you. <laughs> We have a dismal future. And I will say this to you, Derek. Don't neglect your gifts. Those belong to the Lord. Nick, I'm going to miss you. You've been a friend. Your impact on my kids is profound. You know what it is to suffer hardship and maintain your course. And Nick, you have, you have followed your dad's example in being a relentless evangelist and follow his example in being a man of prayer too. GBC has hard work ahead. We have a Dudley, Heddens, Robinson, Miles-shaped hole in our hearts starting tomorrow morning. We can't actually fill it It's unique, irreplaceable. Uh, Omri, we need to do all that you charged us with last week, and we now have to do it without these choice servants. We don't resent it, mostly. Rather, we rejoice. This team is like the arrows on your arm. They have been shaped, fashioned, tested, proven, so that they can be sent out. And may these arrows find their mark directed by our sovereign Lord to bring many to Christ, to build up his church, to labor for harvest beyond their years, we would say, may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. 
It was a marvelous benediction to Omri's ministry that we heard last week. What you heard last week from Omri is what you have heard from him over the whole of his ministry here in counsel and teaching, life on life, in his home at Sagebrush. Grace be with y'all. Four words. So this morning, we say to you, Team Nola, be strong in the grace. Four words from 2 Timothy 2.2. If you are counting on your strength of presence, if you rely on your force of personality, or the weight of your notoriety, or the might of your gifts, or the power of your biceps, know this, God can tear those things down. Be strong in the grace means not just be strong. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Rely on your resources. To be strong in the grace means God wants your humility, your dependence, your godliness in order for you to be truly useful. Be strong in the grace, Paul says. Is this a message to Omri from us? Yes. It is also to Emily, to the Robinsons, to Judy, to the Dudleys, to all those who will join their efforts in Team NOLA in the coming months and years. There is a long, challenging road ahead. They must embrace afflictions that go with church planting. But Grace Bible Church and Gilbert Bible Church, you are not off the hook. The message we'll look at this morning is a message to us as well. Second Timothy is a book with its bookends of grace, just as First Timothy was. Look down at verse 2 of chapter 1. Paul writes, To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And notice the last words of the book. Grace be with you. Grace is the bookends here of this letter as well. And in chapter 1, we see three significant uh, elements of this grace. This is not your sermon outline. Don't start writing down points yet. I know I said the number three. Get anxious. (laughs) I have 32 points this morning, so save those. (laughs) We see in chapter 1, grace to save sinners, grace to preach truth, and grace to suffer hardship. Look down at verse 9. The gospel is the power of God, God, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. It is the grace of God and the grace of God alone that will save sinners. And then verse 11, here is grace to preach. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Paul speaking about himself and referring back to this purpose and grace in God, in the gospel, is what Paul was appointed to. In other words, it is a grace of God to to be appointed as a herald and a proclaimer of the gospel. There's nothing earned or deserved in that. And then in verse 12, it is a grace to suffer For this reason, hearkening back to this same grace and purpose he talked about above, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted him until that day. There is the purpose and grace of God in verse 9, revealed in Christ, giving life through the gospel in verse 10, for which Paul was appointed a, a preacher, proclaimer, teacher, and apostle, for which he suffers unashamed. Because he knows him. This challenging road ahead of you means that you must embrace hardship. Let me turn your attention to Psalm 119. And if I were Omri up here, I would read the whole psalm to you. But we're not going to make any jokes about sermon length or going over time or anything like that here. Psalm 119.65 
This stanza is a reflection of the intersection of God's truth with personal hardship, what the psalmist calls affliction. Notice in verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. And let me point your attention to verse 65. Here's the psalmist's song to God in the context of afflictions, reflecting on God's word. He says, you have dwelt, sorry, you have dealt well with your servant, O Yahweh. What should you say when church planting in New Orleans gets hard? You should embrace it and say, Yahweh has dealt well with his slave. At a church planting professor in seminary, and his words have stuck with me, he taught an entire semester on church planting, and and the sentence I remember is this. If you're going to plant a church, put your hand to the plow for seven years and do not look over your shoulder. You put the plow into tough ground and and you drag it through making furrows so that seeds can be planted and, and you just keep plowing and plowing and planting and plowing and planting and you don't look back to see if something's growing yet. He said, for seven years. The end of seven years, yeah, you can see if something's growing. It's sage advice. Paul is writing this letter of 2 Timothy from prison. And and it's not the house arrest that was his first Roman imprisonment. It was his second Roman imprisonment. And it was the Mamertine prison. That was a sewer dungeon where he was basically dropped into a hole where the sewage ran through the, the bottom of this hole. And he is anticipating his own martyrdom. These are sort of last words from the Apostle Paul to his protege, Timothy. And I'd like to take a stroll through 2 Timothy, surveying Paul's parting encouragements to Timothy. And I don't think we can improve on these. The rest of the content of this message is not mine. It is Paul's to Timothy. It is a series of commands pulled out of this letter with particular application to Omri and Team New Orleans. Right? This is not Paul's letter to Omri. But we are looking at Paul's words to Timothy and seeing significant points of application to the team. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Here comes our 32-point sermons. <laughs> what must you do to be strong in the grace? Well, you must be prayed for, number one. Look at verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Longing to see you. That's not a command for the team. That's a command for Grace Bible Church to pray. You heard Kyle mention it this morning. If God does not raise the dead, people will remain dead in their transgressions and sins. If God doesn't bring people in New Orleans East to himself through the gospel, they will remain lost. We must pray. Point number two. A command, stoke your gifts. Stoke your gifts. Look at verse 6. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul, speaking to Timothy, speaks about the gifts God has given, the equipping for ministry that Timothy had as a stewardship, and a stewardship that's not automatic, but a stewardship that takes work, like keeping a campfire alive. Don't let it die out of neglect. Stoke these gifts. Number three, have courage. Have courage. Look at verse seven. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Be courageous, team, in divine power, in selfless love, and in personal discipline. Number four, join in suffering. Join in suffering. Look at verse eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Suffering is a normal part of the Christian life. 
and certainly accompanies gospel proclamation in difficult places. Number five, cling to truth. Look at verse 13. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. The body of doctrine which will be preached and taught and lived out in New Orleans better be the same body of doctrine that was handed down by the apostles in the New Testament. Retain it. Cling to it. Number six, guard the treasure. Guard the treasure. Look at verse 14. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Uh, This piggybacks on what we just said. You've got to cling to the truth, but it also must be protected. It is a treasure and it has been entrusted, a valuable commodity belonging to God entrusted to feeble, frail servants. And number seven, entrust the treasure. 2 Timothy 2.2. The things which you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, that's that body of apostolic doctrine in the New Testament that must not be turned away from. The things you heard from me, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Four generations in view. Paul, entrusting to Timothy. Timothy must entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Uh, A church in New Orleans needs to outlive this team that goes to plant it. Number eight, suffer like a soldier. Verse three of chapter two, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. There is a chain of command and undistracted loyalty that is demanded. Jesus is the commanding officer. Serve him. Uh, That involves suffering. Boot camp hardships, difficulty, jump. How high, sir? Yes, sir. No, sir. Suffer like a soldier. Number nine, compete like an athlete. Look at verse five. If anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Probably there are the rules of training, uh, the, the regimented life that's required to perform in the, in the moment the starting gun goes off. Have you done all the work leading up to that moment? Are you working hard in the weight room, doing the things nobody sees. You don't win unless you compete that way. Number 10, work like a farmer. I've never been a farmer. I only imagine what farming is like. Uh, One day I spent on a ranch was the hardest day of work I've ever experienced. (laughs) Verse six, the hardworking farmer is to be the first to receive his share of the crops. These three parallels all get at the same theme. Singular devotion to what is required to get the task done. Requires fervency, diligence, discipline. Number 11, remember Jesus Christ. Part of this is in the context of suffering. Remember Jesus Christ as you suffer. Look at verses 8 and 9. Remember Jesus Christ, and then he goes on to the contents and, of who he is and what he did. Risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to the gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. Remember Jesus Christ. I remember Omri's first sermon. It was in the trust, formerly known as H3. And he preached from Hebrews chapter 1 on the superiority of Jesus Christ. It was unforgettable uh, because it, it was so impassioned from a personal love for Christ tied to the details rightly understood from the text of Scripture, but it was boring in another sense. Omri's never said anything different. <laughs> in, in 15 years, his message has been the same. Preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, handling accurately God's word, Proclaiming the gospel. Remember Jesus Christ. You have nothing if you have not him. Number 12, endure for the elect. Look at chapter 2, verse 10. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they may obtain salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. 
Jesus told Paul personally he had people at Corinth. We don't have some special revelatory message that God has people in New Orleans East. We don't know. But how are you going to find God's people in New Orleans East? Indiscriminately preach the gospel to every single one of them and see who God draws. And Paul said he was willing to endure all things for the sake of those chosen so that they might obtain eternal life. Does God choose those who will be saved? Yes, and he uses means. Go be the means. Privilege the truth, number 13. Look at verse 14. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. This means clear the path with God's word, clear the path for God's word, removing obstacles, distractions, and competitors. Don't get distracted by other conversations, other things. You have to be like one of those armored bulldozers that clears out mines and IEDs and makes level ground. Let the Word of God do that. Clear out those distractions. Number 14, work hard at the Word. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of truth. Work at the Word. Diligent, God-pleasing, unashamed, accurate, labor. Number 15, avoid chatter. Number 16, remain useful. To remain useful, you have to abstain from wickedness. To be available for honorable use by the master. Number 17, run from immaturities. Those youthful, strong desires. Sensuality, pride, avarice, power, notoriety, the command here is to hurry up and act like an old, seasoned, humble man. <laughs> Number 18, run after maturity. Paul here calls it righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Number 19, refuse speculations. Number 20, refrain from quarrels. Instead, be kind, teach, be wronged, and be patient when wronged. Number 21, correct with gentleness and hope. Look down at the end of chapter two. In this section, the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Think about the worst opposition to the gospel you will face satanically ensnared to do satanic things against your ministry. Correct them gently with hope. Number 22, prepare for the worst. First half of chapter three, things are gonna get bad. Ultimate victory is assured. Look down at verse 9. Uh, even those who oppose will not make full progress. Their folly will be obvious. In the end, the truth will be vindicated. Number 23, follow and be an example. Look down at verse 10. Paul tells Timothy, You followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings. And as one following an example and one attempting to be an example, you ask the question, is my teaching, is my conduct, is my purpose, is my faith, is my patience, is my love, is my perseverance imitable? And in Paul's case, his persecutions and sufferings were to be imitated. Number 24, continue in the truth. Chapter 3, verse 14. You, however, continue in the things you've learned to become convinced of. Number 25, be equipped. Verse 17. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Where does that equipping come from? The Word of God, breathed out by Him, able to make the man equipped. Always a student always a learner, always growing in the knowledge of the Lord through his word. Chapter four gives us number 26. Preach the word. 
Omri's pulpit is engraved with that phrase. This is a copy of the original. Preach the word. You've got it on the screen. The Greek text, the command. When he looks down at his Bible and his sermon notes, he will be seeing this every week. Preach the word. Be sober. Number 27. Number 28, endure hardship. Number 29, do the work of the evangelist. Number 30, fulfill your ministry. Number 31, love his appearing. Look down at chapter 4, verse 8. This is not strictly a command. This is an encouragement. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. This isn't a command, love Jesus appearing. This is just the definition of a Christian. A Christian is one who loves his appearing. And then number 32, come back soon. Do you see that in verse 9? Make every effort to come to me soon. Now, that was Paul to Timothy, okay? Not necessarily a command, but, but we're going to stretch the application a little bit, Omri, and we're going to ask you, come back. And we would say, God speed to you. Look down at verse 18. Paul testifies in that Mamertine prison in the sewer dungeon hole as he's waiting to be executed. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word safe doesn't seem to go well with what Paul is anticipating. Church history tells us he was beheaded by Nero. That doesn't sound safe. There are a lot of things that don't sound safe. Pulling up stakes and moving across the country planting in a difficult neighborhood, not safe by the world's standards, absolutely safe in God's standards. God did bring Paul safely home. And for all who have loved his appearing, no matter what means God uses to bring you to -to face-to-face with Christ, it will be a traverse safely home. Paul counted on that. Does this team have what it takes? No, they don't. Are they adequate for these things? Are they adequate for successful, fruitful gospel ministry in New Orleans? No. Not any more than we are here in Tempe or Gilbert Bible is in Gilbert. Have they planned for every contingency? Could they prepare for every difficulty? And yet they are well equipped in the Word of God. And that brings an adequacy for a good work. In a moment, we'll sing, and then we will commission the team. We will ask them to come up at the, at the last verse of our closing song, and then a couple of our pastors will pray for them. We'll commission them with elder prayer and Costco sheet cake to follow. I'm going to close us in prayer and then the music team will come and lead us in singing. Lord, thank you for this day. It has been a long time coming and it's not a finish line. It's been a long, slow, steady, faithful walk up to the starting line. And we pray for this marathon that it would be pleasing to you, that it would be worship that it would be lives laid down on the altar of sacrifice even as we look to the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who suffered in our place. Lord Jesus, it was your suffering that purchased people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people that will one day surround the throne in heaven in worship. And we pray that you would get your people in New Orleans. And we pray that you would use these your slaves, to accomplish that for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.